Okay, I think we've given everyone a chance to get started and uh, have their audios link up. So thank you everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here. Today we'll be talking about practical steps for the organization information knowledge lead. Uh, we have with us, of course, a wonderful guest speaker who's coming to us from New York, and we'll get into him a little bit later. But to introduce myself, I'm Tanya. Anderson and I have with me the wonderful Michael Hughes who's coming to us from our London UK office. Michael, if you wouldn't tell us a little bit about uh, our current series and a little bit about Sutron. Sure, thank you Tanya. Uh, so welcome back everybody. Uh, pleasure to have you all with us once more for this session. But for, we do have a couple of new people, um, or more than a couple actually, um, signed on. I guess some people have seen the recording of the first session, so we welcome those attendees to the second part. Um, for those that are a little bit unfamiliar about Sutron Global, just to set the scene very briefly for you, we are a, a cloud-based library knowledge and information management solution provider dedicating to helping information professionals manage library transformation in the best of times and the current times. Um, how we do that exactly uh, is evidenced on the next slide where there are examples of some of the solutions that we offer. Um, so we have a library management system, which is core to our offering as well as a solution around archive and elements of knowledge services management and capability, of course, which is what we're touching on in our topic today. The solution, uh, I beg your pardon, the, the, um, the program, I should say, that we're, that we're, we're gathered under, under today, as part of today, is um, our pandemic recovery program, um, which is, again, evidenced on the next slide, um, where you can see detail around um, what that encompasses. So we are providing a series of webinars, um, free educational webinars for information professionals during the current moment, um, dedicated to or designed rather to give back to info pros uh, at the current time. And we're also offering financial assistance and um, for anybody interested in onboarding with any of our solutions that we saw on the previous screen and also to existing customers in respect of training webinars uh, and educational content as well. So if anybody would like to follow us, find out, find out a little bit more about us in any more detail, um, there's um, avenues to do so on our next, next slide um, where you can see our social media um, channels um, and be able to follow those. So please feel free to do that. I will come back to you later in the session where we have a questions section um, for guys. So just be aware that there is a questions facility on the right side of your screen normally within the GoToWebinar interface. So please feel free to pose any questions to Guy via that channel and I will be happy to put those to Guy further into the session. But without too much further ado, I'll just throw it back to Tanya to very briefly introduce us to our guest speaker and we will be underway with our main program. Tanya, back to you, thank you. Thanks, Michael. So, as I'm sure all of you know, we have the wonderful Guy St. Clair with joining us today, former SLA president and writer of many books, as I've learned today. Um, he is also the 2019 recipient of the John Cotton Dean Award from SLA, which is well deserved as far as we are concerned. Guy, it's all yours. Go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. And I went too fast, so I'm back again. <laughs> I went too fast this time. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. You know my name. I don't have to tell you again. It's right here on the first screen. But I do want to stop uh, before I get too far along. And I want to say a few words about this relationship between Sutron Global and SMR International, my consulting and training firm located in New York City. And in the past, we've been working all over the world. And so we've had a very good relationship relationship with Tony and all of his team over the years. And I especially want to thank this team, uh, Tony, Michael Hughes, Tanya Anderson. You've been wonderful to work with, and I'm very grateful to you for all that you've done to make this a success. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing with uh, knowledge services these days. And uh, I'm going to be giving you some information about what we can do to work with this whole business of recovery. We have heard that the vaccinations are working. In fact, some of us have been 
I'm going to give away my age now. Some of us have been able to get our vaccinations. And uh, so we're looking forward to this thing coming to some sort of a slowing down. We hope an end and we'll get away from this centenary observance, not the right word, but what happened here for us uh, in, in this period, time period, very similar to what happened 100 years ago if they were around the world. Well, one of the things that we learn as we work about COVID with COVID-19 is how much is being written about, uh, how many uh, programs there are. In fact, at SMR International, I did a series, I, I, I referred to and wrote an essay about a series of uh, academic essays on the history of plagues and and virus uh, infections uh, that was put together by academics who were authors for my publisher for knowledge services. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, de Gruyter, uh Czar in uh, uh, Munich. And so we put together, a, they put together a very nice uh, group of essays and they were webinars and I was able to write about them. What we, it's all about knowledge sharing. What we have to do as knowledge services, knowledge professionals, knowledge strategists, we all have to recognize that it's our job to lead the sharing that's going on, especially as a time, at a time like this, because we're not just getting through the epidemic, we're now planning for recovery of after the epidemic. So we think about knowledge sharing, yes, in the 20th century, we had a continuum of information management to knowledge management. We've now moved into the 21st century continuum, which goes from knowledge management to knowledge services. To transition whatever the organization or the community or the group is into a knowledge culture. It works for so many of us. Now, despite the growth and development of KM in business management and related academic and consulting work, I mean, after all, KM was first recognized as about 1991, we also have this collaborative knowledge services. And we think in terms of organization, professional, and it's all subject neutral, and it applies to any group, not just business, not just enterprise. And as such, knowledge services enables the application of management, leadership, and knowledge services principles, which I write about a lot and talk about a lot, to working with information, knowledge, and strategic learning in and throughout the organization or the community or the group seeking to achieve an agreed upon goal or objective. It all has to do with what we're trying to work with the organization so that we understand the strengthened research, contextual decision making, accelerated innovation and successful knowledge asset management all fall into place. And we do have what my friends, I've referred to it before, what my friends jokingly, maybe they're not joking, maybe think they think I'm serious about putting together this kind of an illustration. They refer to this as guy's snail side. Yes, there you see the elements of knowledge services, information management, knowledge management, strategic learning, and what we get, those results that I just talked about. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of those because we're all grown-ups. We're all intellectuals. We're working with knowledge so that we know what these terms mean. But I do want to emphasize, as I think I might have said before, and I hope I'm not repeating myself, one of the things we do with knowledge services is we work with successful we're able to move into successful knowledge asset management and those knowledge assets are not just the books and the databases and all the reports and that sort of thing it's also the people we work with so what we do is we find ourselves working with people a group of people who interact together and that's one of the fundamental elements of knowledge services it's interactive all our planning is done together we are we use network based partnerships we don't care where in the organization the people we're working with are it's all wide open we go there and we work with them we uh, get involved in what we think of as cross-functional communication. We're talking to everybody if it works with what we're doing and we share learning and training. If we find out that somebody's got a program going that's very successful over in the uh, financial services area uh, of our company, we will look and see if there isn't something in content in there that can work for us in our knowledge strategist 
uh, program. We also, at the same time, recognize that knowledge services is characterized by three very specific attributes. Transparency, absolutely, you're not gonna disagree with me on that. We're gonna succeed if we're transparent and open about what we're doing. Collaboration, of course we're gonna to work together, and it's very important to understand that we are collaborating together. And collegiality, we work as an organization of people who think, uh, think how, uh, understand how important it is to do our work together and be collegial, to be respectful of one another. One of the things that we do as a knowledge services professional is we work as a knowledge consultant. We provide expertise in areas that everybody doesn't have. And so they come to us, doesn't matter whether it's business analytics or strategic intelligence. If they don't know how to deal with knowledge uh, issues, that sort of thing, they need us to guide them, to work with them. And we to actually have two roles. Within the organization, we do, we very much do, entrepreneurial consulting. We work with the people in our organization. So what we do mostly, really, when you get right down to it, we work with the people in the organization, and then we have an entrepreneurial or an external focus to work with the organization's external links and people that uh, uh, come to uh, know, know the company. It means that we have a very specific job as the knowledge consultant. We work with knowledge sharing. There are those assets that I was talking about, internal, external, intangible assets. Yes, we do that. We're very good at that because we work with people. Knowledge services itself. Well, you know the tri trio, the trio, uh, uh, trinity, trilogy that we work with. We work with information management and we don't disdain knowledge management. We work with knowledge management and we work with what we call strategic learning, any learning we undertake that helps us do our work better. We also create this culture with knowledge services. We create this culture of shared values that support the organization's vision, mission, and values. All comes together to play. Now, when we do our, this work, we actually have two roles uh, that we we play, uh, one's very specific and one is uh, a, a little bit more subtle. But the first thing we were recognized for and that we're expected to do within the organization is to review and assess what's going on. We inventory and catalog what comes from the organization's mission, value, vision, values, the whole infrastructure. We're, the, we're in the catbird seat. We're the people who look after and take care of anything that anybody knows. We also identify those assets I was telling you about a, a minute ago, or the enablers, the people and the things that help us to do well and help us to identify gaps and constraints that need to be worked with. Now, as what we define, what we do, we establish these objectives, enterprise-wide collaboration, you've heard me talk about that many times, communication, innovation, and this whole business of successful knowledge development, knowledge sharing, knowledge use, with the emphasis on knowledge sharing, and that's what we're gonna be doing as we talk about COVID recovery and what we're gonna be working with. When we move into the post-pandemic stage, I have three questions I'm gonna be asking, and then I'm gonna build some other questions on these three questions. So sort of keep these in mind as we go through our program today. When the organization or the community or the group that you're involved in, as it moves into the post-pandemic stage, are you prepared? Or better yet, my uglier question is, are you willing to be a leader in the management of the organization's intellectual capital? And in terms of the organization or the community or the group's knowledge culture, what's the greatest challenge? What's stopping people? What's keeping people up at night? Got to be thinking, you got to be on top of that as the knowledge strategist. And who is the knowledge champion for the organization, the community, or the group? Do you know someone who is the knowledge champion? What is your relationship with that person? or let's get real specific guy. Is it you? Are you the knowledge champion for the larger organization? I hope you are, because then you are perfectly lined up to be the knowledge strategist, to build a way of dealing with information, knowledge, learning that fits whatever is going on in the mission of the organization, and you can match 
what the organization wants to achieve with what the group wants to achieve. We can help that, we can make that work. We're very lucky to be in this position. And here, thank you, Michael Hughes, for putting me in touch with, well, I didn't get in touch with him. I haven't called him up yet, but uh, John Connolly has this wonderful job as a Central Adult Services Supervisor in Arlington County, Virginia. He must have been reading my mind about what I was going to be speaking about today. Why your library should have a strategic plan. Absolutely. He wrote, John Connolly writes, even under the best circumstances, it's a great idea to have a strategic plan for the library. In the wake of the pandemic, we hear you, John, in the wake of the pandemic, the utility of the strategic plan becomes much higher. So what are we going to do? Well, let's think about this. What is going on in the organization? Is there a group creating a strategic plan for post-pandemic pandemic recovery. Well, now guys can get real tough. Are you part of that group? If you are, good for you. I'm glad to hear that. If you're part of it, participate vigorously. If not, get with it. Recommend that you be appointed to the working group, perhaps as a research specialist or an information knowledge resource strategist. Because if you move into that role, so get there. If you move into that role, you become positioned to guide the group as it studies different plans for the organization to function when the pandemic is finished. Now you, as the knowledge services professional, are going to be working as the knowledge strategist. Why? Because you're the organization's knowledge management manager or leader and leader, and you're uniquely positioned to do what? To understand what's going on as far as communication and knowledge sharing habits go in that organization. You have the professional expertise and background for evaluating how information and knowledge are managed, and you have specific strengths for aligning knowledge value never forget about that you're in charge of aligning large knowledge value and use with overall organizational or corporate goals what a role you have and you have well i say it's a single primary responsibility but i crammed it together and it's really two parts it's to define the knowledge culture for the organization at large and to pave the way or restructuring the enterprise as a knowledge culture, or if it already exists, for, restraint, for strengthening it, making it better. Now, as the knowledge strategist, yes, I've got to tell you about a book I wrote. It's not my latest book, but it's one that I wrote uh, in 2017, and this is the one that's being made available to you if you click, uh, click on the link to get a PDF version of it uh, that, that is, is, uh, you're told about uh, by Sutron. The knowledge services professional as a knowledge strategist. I was asked to create a job description and you know me, or maybe you don't know me, but I will tell you, I'm this very idealistic, theoretical person, and I, get, I dig deep, and I was working for a large organization out on the West Coast, a huge organization we all know about, and they're still using this, as they tell me, as their job description for the knowledge their knowledge strategist. A trusted advisor to the organization, uh, lead and oversee the development of collaboration and implementation strategies, combines management and leadership skills, creativity, and customer focus to define and improve management processes and ensure that great knowledge sol uh, sharing solutions are, are, are delivered in the, this huge organization. Your goal is to ensure that your colleagues have access to and get the best out of their collected knowledge, the organization's intellectual capital. Absolutely. That can be our guiding mantra for us, if that's what we want for our organization. So how do you prepare for being the knowledge strategist for your organization's post-COVID-19 recovery? Well, obviously, you're going to 
begin with this one thing that we do in, and we even ask to do it if it's not part or not one of our assignments. We establish pandemic management intranet pages. We're the knowledge guys. We can collect the links. We can collect the uh, bibliographies. We can do this sort of thing just working in what we do. We establish the pandemic management intranet, intranet pages, make them easy to use, make them readily, uh, readable, so all employees will be able to engage with each other and they'll be able to work together with other people in the organization facing workplace pandemic related situations great thing to be thinking about and in fact i'm not being shy tony told me i could talk about my books so i'm not being shy this is the latest book the one i showed you before and you can get uh, uh at no cost uh, the pen pdf of it that one's that one's the one from three years ago this is the latest one came out just last year i wrote it with barry levy who is the knowledge strategist for a very famous worldwide architectural firm right here in new york city uh, uh cohen peterson and fox and she is also my associate lecturer at Columbia University, and we spend a lot of time working together, and we wrote this book together. So what she did, she heard about, whether she used Sutron's product or not, I don't know, but she heard about maybe in something I gave in the speech, our, our classroom lecture. And uh, an organizational database of employee profiles is ideal for including content for identifying people who know, senior people and staff, who know how to deal with emergency planning. Now, it's connected at Sutron with the Sutron Skills database product. What Barry did, she co-authored this book, as I've just said, she was able to recognize that employee engagement requires having this tool available, something like this, for all employees. So she built it. She recommends using it as the easy to use database for identifying pandemic recovery expertise. And there's more. Uh, there, uh, uh, other people get very involved in this. Stan Garfield, who wrote this book on community team management. Stan is probably one of the most important people in the world. In fact, right now, I can't attend it. Right now, going on is his uh, program uh, for the SIKM, the Knowledge Management Leadership Group, that happens once a month. He's been doing it since uh, 2005 or something like that. And he'll have 7,500 people attending these discussions. And uh, there's a speaker and then there's a discussion. But he is so well known about communities of practice and how to work with, uh, with them. And he suggests that you put out to anybody you know or create a new community of practice to uh, establish one so that it's people are able to work together managing intellectual capital as it comes up as this work is we're, we're working with post uh, recovery uh, content that we've got to share another idea uh comes from dale stanley my uh, business partner at smr international and uh, a noted advocate he includes sponsors as critical players he goes he suggests with every every consulting act activity we get involved in with he we wrote a series of management plans and we tell our, our clients this all the time how sponsors are essential and we get senior people in the organization to volunteer to be part of the sponsoring team that supports the organization, the library, the research center, whatever it is, and express, model, and reinforce what's going on, the commitment to successful knowledge sharing. Those are the very people you want involved in your post uh, COVID recovery. Deb Hunt, too, who has done programs for uh, uh, Sutron Global, she, and her, she sees that we need to, she thinks we need to work with knowledge workers who do not necessarily have our close at hand experience with knowledge sharing. They're allies that we can grow them to be associated and to work with us in, in this whole business of COVID 19 recovery. And she very much thinks about how we advise and mentor these people working with others uh, uh, in the profession so that they can become more skilled and can come on board to work with us in our post-COVID-19 recovery efforts. Tim Powell, writing a book about the value of knowledge. Tim Powell wants to know 
whether he's talking about building a a a, 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 a support system, a sponsor, a group of sponsors, or whether he's talking about just other senior leadership. He's asking, can you establish whether the organization, your organization's senior leadership supports a knowledge development culture, and are you willing to work with it? He says that in the things that we're looking at right now, he emphasizes in terms of COVID-19 recovery, he emphasizes the importance of measures and even suggests, good for you, Tim, instead of attempting to create new metrics for knowledge, think about how we as knowledge strategists might use and adapt business enterprise metrics that are already in place so that they can be applied to the COVID-19 recovery effort. We've got a long way to go here and it's going to work. How do you create and implement a more grassroots or conversational knowledge culture? Well, I talk a lot about John Hovel because I go to the programs he's put together. He and David Gertine are just so involved in this whole business of community, uh, of conversational leadership, conversational community ship, they call it. They've given it a new name. And John is actually writing a book for our series called Creating Conversational Leadership, Expanding and Combining Knowledge Management, Organizational Development, and Diversity and Inclusion. It's going to be published later this year. And as he talks about how knowledge leaders can learn to appreciate the extraordinary but underutilized power of conversation, the whole idea is to give society a new approach to the way we live and work together. So can't we not use that a new approach to informally roll out certain components of your knowledge or culture in the organization and see if they, if they can stick? It, can you make them relate to the knowledge, the COVID-19 recovery? It's very important that we keep that in mind and make that attempt. Another one, another uh, way of preparing comes from my colleague, Marsha Stepanek, one of my best friends. Uh, she's a multimedia general, journalist, lots of journalism prizes, and she is a media professor, and she, and one of my dearest friends, and she too is writing a new book for us. It seems like I ask everybody I know to write a book for us. Anybody who's listening in want to write a book, let me know. I'll work with you. Uh, anyway, Marsha Marcia says that what we have to talk about is who owns the organization's knowledge domain and how can it be used? What, How do we, can be, we build a relationship with the, this person who is responsible and how can we establish a working relationship so that we can work together for post-COVID-19 recovery? She says her work is to bridge the gap between organizations with knowledge services needed to harness the changes that we need for hyperconnectivity and still re uh, re reluctant or unable to undertake the changes that need to be made. Marsha is special concerned with knowledge ownership because right now, if we ever needed it, I'm sure they needed it in post uh, the post-1919 uh, 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 endemic, uh, pa pandemic, and I don't know that they had it, but her special concern is with who owns the knowledgeship in the productive organization and how do we put it together so that we can use it for post-COVID-19 recovery. Managing change. Yes, it's the name of the game. Frame out phrase I use all the time. It's a recognized functional element in all organizations and groups and communities. And Andrew Berner, who many of you know, he's the library director and curator of collections at the University Club of New York. It is one of the largest private, probably the largest private club library in the world. And it has enormous programs and because of what's going on right now, there have been some changes that have been brought about by the pandemic. But guess what? Some of them have turned out to be positive. For all its horrors, Berner says, the pandemic provided opportunities as well. At the club where Andrew works, more than a century of on-site programs, lectures, events became virtual overnight. Suddenly we were reaching a far broader audience, he says, than was possible before. And he continues, we've made a rather earth-shaking decision for a private organization. When our on-site programs return, which they will in the near future, 
Most will be hybrid programs offered virtually as well as in person. We will be presenting events and lectures and knowledge sharing opportunities to a far larger audience than we would ever before have imagined that we could reach. So much is going on. Kevin Banyan, Senior Manager of Employee Services at Amazon in Seattle, specifies that knowledge strategists must understand that management and leadership principles both support and drive knowledge strategy. And what that ha what we do with that in terms of post-COVID-19 recovery, well, we stop and think. Who's the first person you think of for discussing this person, this important subject? Is it someone one who is aware that work is needed? Or are they caught in the old fashioned, if it ain't broke, don't fix, fix it point of view? Well, I have to tell you right now that this knowledge champion, if they're the latter one, they're out of date. It is broke, it has to be fixed. And so what Mangan says, knowledge leadership main, that maintains and sustains the knowledge culture is going to pave the way for the post COVID-19 recovery for knowledge professionals. So, the management of what an organization knows or needs to know is changing drastically. I don't need to tell you that. It's happening, it's happening so fast that a lot of people are really kind of uncomfortable and having some trouble dealing with it. Managing the organization's collective content ensures success in the organizational mission. And that mission relates to how we deal with recovery after COVID-19. I stop and think, what about younger people in the organization or the group or the community? How are they participating? Have we brought them in to see that knowledge services is a valuable element in what the organization is doing? Do they share information, knowledge, and strategic learning easily? Do they require encouragement? Who is the guide or mentor or knowledge leader these younger people have been looking for? Well, until now, we, I'm saying we, we aspiring guides, mentors, and knowledge leaders have not codified or articul had codified or articulated knowledge services principles. We had overarching management principles. We have a, o overarching leadership principles. We knowledge services strategists have those down pat, but we never had anything for, uh, never said anything about uh, how we would, what principles we had for knowledge services. Now we have them, they're in this book. Barry and I came up with them. We're very proud of them and we like what we've done. So I'm gonna wrap up. Of course I have to wrap up, my time is up. I may have gone too long. A quotation, as I said a month ago in that presentation, a quotation from Guy's new favorite person. Oh, how I wish I could get to meet her and just sit with her for an hour and say, talk to me. Talk to me about what you want us at our age to do for you and with you for the future. The answer I think she would give would be like the last four lines of her poem at the inauguration and what I would use to think about how we can approach the post-COVID recovery. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. Thank you very much. Here's a little bit about me, probably more than you need to know, uh, and here's how to get in touch with me. I want to hear from you. Uh, so. Uh, if anything I've said today relates with what you're doing or thinking about, if there's something you'd like me in here to comment on, let me know. Uh, I have former students from my years at Columbia University. I have students going back to 2010, sending me birth announcements and wedding invitations from all over the world. So I keep up with my students, with people I've worked with, with clients and colleagues. So let me hear from you if you have anything you want to say. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your being with me. Goodbye. And I goodbye. Thank We're you, guys. <laughs> not yet, not yet. <laughs> Thank you, Guy. It's uh, very interesting. And um, I think your enthusiasm and passion for the topic has really 
you know, very self-evident and, and it resonates through the talk and I, I certainly enjoyed that and I think other people will have done so also. Um, I can tell actually because the, there are some questions that have been posed already. Um, so <laughs> we'll just remind you, we, we will just take a few questions if everybody will allow and, and if people want to hear the answers then please do stick around. Um, if you do have your own burning question please just pop it into the um, the chat box there or the questions box on the right side of the screen and we'll we'll put that to Guy. Um, but um, first off, Guy, you, you talked about um, enterprise-wide collaboration and network-based um, partnerships and not minding where people are in an organization, um, mm -hmm. as long as they are of value. Um, it's a good question. Um, how do you now find, any tips, how do you now find uh, or connect with such people, um, given that they may have started in the last 12 months and you, you may never have met them? Um, you may have touched on some of this with what you were talking about working group appointments and intranets, but um, any other tips for kind of well identifying those younger users and those new starters that have come on stream yeah. in the last year or so? I love this question and you're gonna, you know, Michael, be sure you shut me up because I could talk the rest of the day. <laughs> uh, that's what I was getting to at the very end. We do have this opportunity, it doesn't matter whether they're younger people or if they're people who are just newer into the organization. We have to put on our, um, our sort of assertiveness hat. We have to look at what's going on in the lunchroom. We have to look at some of these people who are we haven't seen before. And we have to be make sure you got your business card up to date. We've got uh, that has your office telephone number on it uh, and your email address, et cetera, et cetera. If you see people you don't know, go talk to them, speak to them, say, by the way, I don't think I've seen you before. Do you mind if we speak? I'm Guy St. Clair. Can I sit down and have a cup of coffee with you? Now, they oftentimes say no on my occasion because they've got something to think about. But uh, just introduce yourself and say, I happen to be in charge of knowledge services here. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the organization, or maybe you are, it's your title. I am the knowledge strategist for the organization. My job is to help you know. So come and see me. Let's talk. I'd like to help you. I'd like to work with you. So that's what I say. That's the question the, the uh, uh, questioner posed was, how do you find them? You find them. The key word is you. Right. Thank you, Guy. And also visibility. I think you get to get yourself visible. Um, so, yeah, that's really good. The, there is one other one here as well, Guy. Um, the, the HR department um, of the company where I head up research services is inundated with requests for information about unemployment benefits and similar subjects relating to staff benefits. Um, how can I, as the knowledge specialist, provide assistance um, to the department? Or should I even offer? Is it appropriate for me uh, to do so? Well, <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back to maybe the opposite of what I said a little while ago. No, not the opposite, a different slant on making mm. yourself known and whether something's appropriate or isn't. What I would think about would be to question what you mean by appropriate uh, and think that it should probably be restricted to your professional expertise as the knowledge strategist. Now, you and your team could very usefully supply information with respect to those subjects you just talked about, uh, benefits, staff benefits, et cetera, et cetera, about what be, what's being done, for example, in similar organizations. So sure, I think you should offer to help how deep you should go, quote unquote, or whether helping out in HR or human capital is appropriate, mm, follow your instincts. Get a feel for how official or perhaps even long-term members of that, that unit uh, have been around. How would they react? You've been in the organization long enough to know what's going on. And you can, you can say that, uh, you can see whether it's appropriate or whether people would be uncomfortable. And I can tell you, because I've been in this situation myself. You'll be told by someone if your services aren't needed. So my sense is in most cases, they'll be very grateful to have your expertise and your assistance as they deal with the volume of work they're trying to deal with. If they don't want it, there's nothing you can do about it. Except as I say, with the sort of a figure, your, your work, your professional expertise as knowledge strategist, uh, what you do in helping people get the information they need, that sort of thing. Does that help? Right. 
It does. I think. I think so. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. We'll just squeeze one more in. I, in, in the, I, I know we're running over time, but it's, I just want to sort of give the person the opportunity to to kind of put their question to you, if if I may. Um, our library uh, has suffered major staff reductions during the pandemic. Um, how do we determine that? what constitutes an essential service? We simply can't do everything that we um, used to or we usually did. Oh dear, okay, what a good question. What a very good question. And uh, uh, you didn't say if it was an academic institution, oh, so. And I'm since sorry, I, I missed that bit, it's, it is a, it's a college. Oh, it's a oh, well, I'm a teacher. That makes life a lot easier, it makes answering the question a lot easier. <laughs> uh, uh, well, first of all, you're going to have to stop and think about uh, what the emergency situation is in some of the academic institutions. They're all over the place. We're all dealing with it. So now it's time to go beyond the emergency situation. And since it is an academic institution, my first response would be to request a meeting with representatives from the dean's office, from HR, uh, from some, some of the more senior faculty and staff let's talk about what we're going to be doing um and this kind of ties into what we were talking about with the uh, uh, uh topic of our presentation that it has to do with post-covid recovery so in the in the meeting phrase it uh, uh do do it in all overall terms but you know what leave out the part about we can't do everything that we're expected to do it's a problem every department has so just leave that part out and focus sure. on what other people, other senior people in the organization are considering uh, essential or, uh, uh, yeah, what, what they consider essential. And then you can move on to doing those, you know, do a packing order. What's the most essential? What's a little bit less essential? That sort of thing to get you through the next several semesters and see if you can get back on board. Is that does that work, Michael? I hope it works. I think so. Thank you, Guy. I, I, I'm a cheeky guy, and I'll ask you one more. Um, how do you convince the organisation uh, that leadership in knowledge strategy is your role and function when your title is librarian? Um, yep, I've dealt with this for I won't tell you how many years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lifetime member, a lifelong member of uh, SLA, so I guess that that says something. What we do is we try to continually, in conversation, in uh, documents that are prepared, we try as much as we can to, even if we have to sign it, you know, Guy St. Clair, librarian. We got, you say Guy St. Clair, librarian, in my role as reference uh, uh, support or something like that, or in my research or in, and build up your job. Let me, make sure that you're, even if that's your title and you can't change and if you can't change the title make it bigger than it looks don't get me wrong librarians i'm not saying librarianship isn't a very important field i'm talking about what people in the outside world might have perceptions about librarianship and i would say just build it up play it up as good as as high as you can and i'll bet you'd have some have some results thank you guy i really appreciate that um i don't think we have any more, so I'll just throw it over to Tanya to close us out. Uh, but yeah, thank you ever so much, Guy. That's very interesting. Good, thank you. All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here. And thank you again, Guy, of course. Uh, if you'd like, we have another session already scheduled for April. So check out our events page. You can also follow us on our social media, where we'll be posting information about both the new sessions as well as uh, Guy's um, uh, session. Uh, we'll also be sending out to everybody a copy, a digital copy of Guy's book. You'll have a PDF of the um, presentation so you can read through it if you need to. And of course, you'll have a recording at the end. So again, thank you for attending. Uh, and if you need anything, here is our contact information if you need us. Take care. Visit uh, Sutron Global uh, for our latest uh, knowledge services blogs. You can actually read the article that uh, Guy referenced by John Connolly, and uh, we'll see you next month. Take care, everyone.